All right, last year I was actually on this stage and, um, and I gave a little talk, and I'm actually just going to play a quick um, excerpt of, of that right now. I'm going to talk about web development workflow. Because I think over the past two years in particular, there's been a lot of tools that we've gotten as developers to increase our productivity, reduce our stress. Putting them together in a kind of a workflow that makes sense has been an interesting little challenge. So I'm going to walk through kind of what my approach has been, what I've seen other developers doing. Uh, first thing I should point out, please try and pay no attention to the enormous rhinoceros genitalia behind me. <laughs> uh, it's, it is distracting. It is very distracting. Um, <laughs> but anyways, so yes, last year I talked about the JavaScript workflow of 2013. Um, so I figured it would be kind of good to revisit that now that it's 2013. So this is the JavaScript authoring workflow of, of now. Um, yeah. So uh, a few things I touched on last year, um, just quick little excerpts, things here and there. So I think having real-time feedback is an important thing, live recompilation and live reload. Now, my style sheet here, the SAS file. The next is source maps. OK, just quick little bits and bobs of technologies, um, buzzwords, but all useful things. And last year, I kind of showed kind of pulling these together, kind of disparate technologies to kind of come into a workflow that kind of worked together. Um, but on the Chrome DevTools team, we've been thinking about this and figuring out how we can make this into a more cohesive workflow. And I want to show you some of the features um, that have kind of come out of that work. So the first up is called Workspaces. Um, but um, OK, uh, this is embarrassing. Um, so just bear with me. I'm going to fix this right now. Just da -da -da. OK, this is probably kill this. Actually, I'm going to come over to my editor. Let's make some room first so that we can put in some new styles. Uh, I don't need this width. That should fix that. Can turn off this box shadow. Is that a line height? That looks about right. OK. Ish. Font size? Ooh, yeah. All right, all right. All right, let's make these, bring these changes over to my editor. Oh, let's change on disk reload. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Oh, all right. So you can see here. <laughs> Nice. DevTools is doing this work for me. So as I'm making changes in the Styles pane, it's going to bring these back to disk. And so let's say I actually want to add something back over here inside Sublime. Let's see. We'll do one pix, one pix, 10 pix, and white. Um, just hit Save and come over here. And yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty good. Um, but I'm going to go black instead. Yeah, it's sharp. OK, cool. Styles are looking good, um, but we still have Whoops. Um, so this is a HTML slide deck, but um, I'm using uh, Markdown for the content. So let's edit the Markdown. I'm going to hit Command-O and just bring up slides.md. And uh, here is that typo. Just change that to lowercase and hit Command-S to save. Command-R to refresh. Looking good. Cool. Nice. So this is Workspaces. Workspaces allows me to bring in a folder on my system into the DevTools and edit it. What the DevTools is going to be able to do is map this to what's coming over the wire. So I can have my full back end serving up this content. DevTools is going to map the resources so that when I make changes to things on screen, it's going to be able to make these changes to what's persisted on disk as well. I can edit everything. This is, you know, this is Markdown here. The DevTools team itself actually edits the C++ bindings for DevTools inside of DevTools. Um, style changes, as I make them over here in the Styles pane, they persist. Uh, all these changes are, are kept and persist to disk. I can edit anywhere. Full undo, redo, especially here. Um, and this is great, because I'm able to maintain my context, not keep switching between two separate things, just do it all in one place. All right. Next thing up. SAS. This was uh, something that I mentioned last year, and a lot of people have been asking about this, and I wanted to bring you up to date with how this works inside the DevTools now. All right, to do this, I'm going to bring up uh, a version of HTML5, please. And this is looking good, but I want to actually try experimenting with this guy right here, this little use uh, badge. 
So I'm going to open up the dev tools, and I'm going to try changing the color of it. <coughs> All right, so here we are. This looks good. The uh, use has got a background box shadow and border right, all green, but a little getting darker in the greens uh, as it goes down. So if I want to try changing the color, I'm, gonna, I'm really keen on indigo lately. I don't know why. It's just it's cool. But yeah, that, that really doesn't work out so hot. Um, all right, Command Z. Good, yes. Um, so if I click through actually on style to S on CSS, you'll those of you who are SAS users will notice this looks like compiled, uncompressed CSS coming from the SAS compiler. So what I should really be doing is authoring in SAS. So let's turn that on. We go to the DevTools settings and bring up experiments and turn on SAS. Cool. Refresh the page, bring back up the DevTools, and go back to my selection. Now the first thing that you're going to notice is pretty small. It's that here, against the, the use rule, you're seeing the location in the SAS file where this is coming from. So I'm going to click through on that. All right, cool. So here we are in my SAS file. And uh, it looks like use is actually using a, um, a mix-in. Um, but I wanted to change that color. So we're going to have to dig a little, little bit deeper. So when I come back over here and I hit Command. And you can now see that these things are a little clickable. So I'm going to Command click on Background. And we jump into the extends file, where our mixins are defined, background, box, shadow, border, right? And yep, the b color that's coming in uh, right here is, in fact, just being darkened as it comes down. All right, that makes sense. But again, I need to change that color. I'm going to come back to Elements and Command click on the color itself. Nice, all right. So now we're over here in our variables SAS file. And the cursor was placed immediately where this variable was defined. So the use one is right here. And this is that green. And um, so I want to try it as indigo, Command S. Yeah, nice. <clears throat> yeah, these are pretty good. But honestly, that green probably worked the best. I'm going to just Command Z back my way to that green. Cool. All right, so this is done with no Chrome extensions at all. This is just straight up DevTools. In fact, the only thing that I have going on in addition to uh, the SAS support and workspaces is I do have a SAS watch daemon that's just watching these things and recompiling on the fly. But DevTools is doing the work of bringing in the new changes as they come in. So we have full traceability from my CSS, the selectors, properties, and variables back to the original SAS sources, whether it came from a mix-in, a variable, or whatever. This is actually enabled by source maps. I talked about it last year, source maps for JavaScript. This is the same technology just for CSS. Um, and this was contributed uh, to the SAS compiler core by the DevTools team. And I should mention that um, if you're not a SAS user and you like stylus or less, um, the implementation is completely agnostic. So once less or Stylus gets support to create these source maps. It's going to work the exact same way. It's great. And a full automatic reload of the style sheet as uh, changes come in. Pretty nice. So these changes combined really change things up. DevTools can become my editor. Um, I think this is really powerful, because I'm getting this real-time feedback as I'm typing, as I'm making changes. I see the style changes as I type them out, whether they're in CSS or SAS. These are pers persisted to disk my way of uh, work, workspaces. <clears throat> if I'm doing JavaScript, I can edit that, and it's reevaluated on the fly. It's just patches are sent up to V8, and it just takes care of it. Great when you're doing any sort of Canvas work. Um, and this is also cool because when you author code and you're in the same debugging environment, you're able to breakpoint debug right in the same place, which leads to a great cohesive environment. All right. Last year, I also brought up package management, but I covered it in kind of a hand-wavy way. I'm going to play that. Package management is something that, in a year from now, we're going to have a really robust package management tooling infrastructure and a lot of packages in the community. Right now, it's kind of still finding its, its footholds, um, but we'll be seeing some more things coming out soon, I think. Yeah, that uh, was actually just a few weeks before the release of Bower. Bower is a package manager project that I've been involved in since the beginning, and it's really been taking off. Fantastic thing. Um, the community and the registry have kind of blown up. This is a view of all the components that are in Bower, and it's now up to a little over 2,200 components available in the registry. 
really great for you as a user and whenever you want to pull something. And it has dependencies, it works great, but also great for the ecosystem because it means that we're able to build upon each other's work in a lot more of a cohesive way. <clears throat> If you want to get up to speed on this, there was a great presentation about Bower done at Google I.O. just two weeks ago. Um, Dan Hubbard showed off a lot of great stuff, including a really nice workflow using Bower and required JS, with also Yeoman and Grunt, to create this great experience of using package management, something that you might expect from another language, um, but having it here inside of uh, JavaScript for the front end. All right, I want to come back to performance. And talking about performance at a JavaScript conference, um, I might talk about JavaScript performance, but it's good to keep in mind that JavaScript is not kind of, it's not always the best target. These are slides from actually from the IE team back when they released IE 8. But this stuff is as true as it then as it was now. Um, up here we have, they took a look at the top 100 sites and saw where IE 8 was spending its time. And just 16% of its time was spent in JavaScript. Rest of it in layout, rendering, formatting. And even for Ajax heavy sites, like JavaScript heavy sites, like um, Gmail and Google Maps, um, just still a fraction. So JavaScript is often a small fraction of the overall performance picture. So if you want to find out how to make your app, your site fast, I recommend you take a look at the timeline inside the Chrome DevTools. So I'm going to show that to you now. <clears throat> All right. So this is a kind of infographic parallax site. It's pretty cool. And I'm just going to scroll through it so you get a chance to see what's going on. So as I scroll down, I kind of got this orange circle bubbly guy, and then these circles over here with kind of this awesome physics explosion. Um, and then we come down here, we have this parallax effect. It's pretty cool. I'm going to keep going down, keep going down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These white little dots that form this grid and then just kind of like take over the place. And that's about it. All right. <clears throat> Let's come back up and I'm going to open up the DevTools this time and drag it down to the bottom, open up the timeline. And I'm going to start recording. You can just hit Command D. It's kind of quick. And then I'm just going to scroll through the same stuff. Do, 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 do. All right. Now, what's really cool about this is that we get a view of the performance of this page kind of in as a narrative. It starts off at the beginning, it's pretty chill, and then we move on to this section here where there's a lot of green. Now, this is up at the top where we're building out this kind of orange explosion of circles. And the green is sp time spent in paint. And here we're painting the entire page on every single frame, and it's taking a good amount of time. Then we go into this section where there's a lot of yellow, and this is JavaScript executing. That is when we're hitting uh, this little physics action right here. Then it's pretty quiet for this section in the middle. We're hitting our target frame budget of 60 FPS, mostly staying underneath that for the most part. And then down at the bottom, we kind of have this cacophony of colors. A lot of things happening as this kind of white thing's exploding, um, both painting, JavaScript, and also a good amount of purple layout here um, is going on. But Timeline is giving us this overall view and finding what our bottlenecks are in each kind of section so we can be a little bit more precise in how we address these performance issues. So if I want to look into this section right here, um, I'm going to do that. So let's see, we're right here. Um, and I want to get a better idea of this actual JavaScript performance. <coughs> so let's do that. I'm going to go over to timeline, uh, Profiles and collect a CPU profile. Hit Command E. And it's probably good. And now I come over here and um, so this you should be used to, kind of the aggregate view, everything that's going on. And it is telling me kind of here are all the things that happened in summation. But what it's not doing is giving it to me in kind of this view where I get to see frame by frame what happened bit by bit. <clears throat> so this is something that we thought we could address and also give you a better idea as far as a visualization of this action. So I want to show to you a new feature. And it's called the flame chart. All right. So here we have the flame chart. <clears throat> And we're able to identify kind of at a time scale, across time, how things are changing. In this case, it's actually pretty consistent. Um, frame by frame, it looks like it's mostly executing the same JavaScript. It would change color if not. Um, and then I can also drill in. So this is one frame in particular. And in this case, uh, width 
is time, and height is call stack, so height's not too, too important. But um, if I want to look in, I can see a few things. Let's say uh, here, looks like D3 is kind of running the show. So all my time is spent inside D3. We got some insert child, so it's doing some uh, SVG inserting. Um, and then we have this quad tree view, quad tree view, quad tree view, insert child, and also the attribute function, um, just setting in some new attributes on the SVG on the end of the frame. This is uh, seven milliseconds in this case, which is a considerable amount of time to happen every single frame. But this visualization is giving me a great view as far as what is soaking up this time and what should I address first. All right, so that's the new flame chart. You can check it out in Chrome Canary today. Um, we also have a canvas profiling experiment that I want to show to you now. So this uh, here is just this uh, WebGL aquarium, and I'm going to open up the DevTools and take a canvas profile. So it's going to record a single canvas frame, and it's recording all the f calls that contributed to that frame. And we can poke through all the draw calls one by one, and just hitting the down arrow on the keyboard, walking through how this scene was actually drawn. So you can see <sighs> the fishes come in, the shark come in, the, the, the ball kind of come in, and everything else. And then you can open up the draw calls and see all the function calls that contributed to that draw and go back to the sources. So this is cool, but this is a platform. This is we are able to record and replay Canvas and WebGL action. Um, but really, where we go from here is up to you. Um, so please, we're interested in your feedback and kind of what you would like to see next as far as a Canvas profiler. All right. Almost out of time, I'm going to wrap up with five key DevTools performance features. First up, continuous repaint mode. If you're in the timeline and you see a lot of time is spent inside green painting, then you probably want to head over to continuous repaint mode. What this is going to do is tell the browser, hey, paint the page again and again and again and again. And what this allows you to do is turn off elements and styles, figure out what is contributing to the amount of time that it takes to paint the page. Um, and this is able to, to let you find out what's contributing and what you could adjust. Um, it, it changes, so it's a, it's a little tough to give an aggregate view of, but you're able to find out exactly what's contributing there. There's also the FPS meter, um, which gives you a good view of how fast you're sending updates to the screen. So in addition to just showing uh, the frames per second, we also have a min and max for that view, a histogram, and also the GPU memory. So you can see how much memory is being used by this current tab, how much is allocated. And if you have a lot of heavy imagery, you're going to be constantly evicting things out of the GPU memory, which is probably going to soak up a, a good amount of GPU performance. Next up, show paint recs and layer borders. These are available as settings inside the DevTools. Really great for identifying paint issues. So you might be repainting the entire page on every single scroll. You don't want to do that. And this is going to show you a visual view of that happening really fast. In this case, it uh, looks like this div was just repainted, and we have a, a layer over here with the gold border. Um, it's actually the scroll bar, which Chrome actually composites right on top of the page. The Object Allocation Tracker is a brand new tool. If you're doing a lot of memory analysis, this is going to be key for you. So you get to do a recording, and it's going to take continual heap snapshots over time. You're able to identify and drill in on one specific part, see um, what objects were allocated in that section, what their retain size, and what their retaining tree, which is great if you're trying to identify where your memory is coming from and where it's going. Lastly, layout thrashing. Back in uh, this timeline here, we're seeing a good amount of time spent in layout. And here, we're able to identify a bunch of stuff. If you have a DOM-heavy web application, you might see something like this, where you're doing layout and layout and layout, and there's no paint. You're doing all this work. You're asking the browser to do all this work, and the user's never seen a lot of it. And this is a problem. So DevTools is going to tell you that with this little icon, and it's a possible performance bottleneck. Um, but it's also going to give you a lot of other useful information, too the amount of nodes that need layout, the tree size, the scope, and also a full call stack for why the layout was invalidated, why it was forced. You can drill into those functions and find exactly why these things were caused, and maybe you're going to need to change some things around. So a lot of details, and this is key for getting good performance on web applications. <clears throat> OK, that's a lot of stuff. The Chrome DevTools documentation has recently got a bunch of new updates um, covering the, these things and a bunch more, including remote debugging. Everything I showed today uh, is available 
as you remote debug your phone. Uh, so it's a really powerful setup, and I encourage you to check that out. Um, and everything I showed today is also available in Chrome Canary. Some are behind experiments, but I encourage you to check it out, try things, holler at me, tell me what you like, what you don't like, um, and uh, it'll be good. But thank you guys very much.